Since 2008, Dr. McKenzie has been a moving force within my house. Since his presence here, family work, families have been strengthened by his powerful family life workshops and free, I said free, counseling service. He is passionate for identifying, for edifying his flock with weekly sermons as well as annual revivals like Daniel, Revelation, Lay, and Family Life. You remember that, don't you? Yes. And when it comes to delivering the word of God, man, he's nothing to compete. Sorry. Well, anyway, it is Pastor's Appreciation Week. And can I share a word, my favorite word from the pastor, if you don't mind? Pastor? Um,
turn our Bibles to the book of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's turn to the book of John for our scripture reading. John chapter 8. Can anybody tell me what is the message today? A sinner in the hands of sinners. John chapter 8. Now let us read from verse 1 on to 11. Everybody, what it says. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees, Elder Ali, brought unto him a woman taken in the act of adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery, the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that she should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, and that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down. Everybody say stooped down. And with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast, let him what? Cast. Let him first cast a stone at all. The message is a sinner in the hands of sinners. Verse 8. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Had no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Amen. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us here today. Every time we come into your midst, Lord, we know we will receive a blessing. We pray, God, that we will leave here not like we came in, but we will leave here with power. We will leave here forgiven. We will leave here delivered. We will leave here anointed. Bless us now as we listen to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. A sinner in the hands of sinners. Few days ago I read in the newspaper. I have the habit of going on the internet and reading the newspapers of my beloved country, Guyana. Are you there? And so I read in the papers. A young man hacked his three children to death 
all of them, their ages in single digit. He hacked them to, to death while they were asleep. The cops took him and they placed him in the prison. Upon his arrival, the prisoners beat him to the doors of death. They rushed him to the hospital. The doctors saved his life. Upon his discharge, they took him back to prison. And as soon as he entered the walls of the prison, the prisoners, I said the prisoners, give him another beating. This time they had to isolate him just to spare his life. It's a terrible thing when a sinner falls in the hands of other sinners. <laughs> F.B. Myers, my favorite author, he said, I quote, It is a terrible thing for a sinner to fall into the hands of his fellow sinners. John chapter 8 contains the story of a sinner fell into the merciless hands of her fellow sinners. Are you following me today, church? Uh, this story occurred at a time of condemnation in the life of Jesus' ministry. By now, he had developed a well-structured, organized class of followers. By now, brothers and sisters, he had a great following of evil enemies. May I warn you, as long as you are living for the Lord and doing the Lord's will, you will not only have followers who are supporters, you will also have enemies. Amen. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us, Jesus himself in Luke chapter 6, verse 26. Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you. Is anybody here today walking around the place wanting everybody to like them? I stopped by here today to tell you, you are running after a senseless and an impossible goal. As long as you are living for the Lord. And as long as you are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will not only have supporters, you will also have enemies. The Bible tells us that Jesus had enemies. His enemies, mainly the religious leaders of the day. But they aim to kill him. The Bible tells us that they hatched a plan lure him into a trap of words. This is the substance of John chapter 8. It's true. The story began with Jesus very early in the morning teaching in the temple. Uh, scholars and theologians tell us he was teaching in the temple courts. Uh, the Bible tells us, brothers and sisters, that he was teaching a large crowd, a great crowd. You see, by now, the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles had come to an end. And great multitudes were still gathered in Jerusalem. And so as Jesus was teaching the crowd, the multitude, the Bible tells us that he was suddenly interrupted by a bevy of men dragging a woman practically naked, clinging to a bed sheet, claiming that she was caught in the act of adultery. Uh, no church of the living Lord, one would have thought that has, as religious leaders, they would have had some respect and reverence for the temple of the living Lord. But church of the living Lord, they had none. Uh, you can't come into the temple of the living Lord 
practically half naked. Ah, Church of the living Lord, I tell you how you treat the temple of God tells your level of respect and reverence for the God of the temple. Uh, the Bible tells us that they dragged this woman practically naked into the temple of the living Lord. Uh, I thought they would have had some respect. Uh, you wouldn't come naked, then don't bring anybody naked. But brothers and sisters, they were religious. They were religious leaders, but not really godly. We are coming down there. The Bible tells us that my house shall be called a house of prayer. In other words, my house is not a place where you are base folks. My house is not a place where you deface people's character and make them public spectacles. My house is a place where burdens are lifted. My house is a place where the weary find refuge. My house is a place where the rejected and restricted find support. My house is a place where God meets with his people. My house is a place where humanity mingles with divinity and feeble sinners leave with power. Power to walk on waters. Power to mash scorpions. Power to walk through the fires. My house is a place where God's people meet with God. Somebody say hallelujah. Now some folks, some folks believe that this story is all about a woman caught in the act of adultery. But when you see this story in a different eye, uh, this is what you will realize, that this story is really talking about the composition of God's church. Can I tell you about that for a moment? The Bible tells us that they dragged this woman into the temple courts. Who dragged her? Remember. <coughs> and Pharisees. In other words, Sister Clements, the religious leaders of the day, the members of the church, now I thought that they would have been the most merciful. But I had the shock of my life. They were the most ruthless. Is anybody listening to the preacher? One author said, that the church is the only place that shoots its wounded. Uh, I'll say that again because it seems as though you're not following me. Now I feel like preaching, but you gotta help me. Now I'm saying to you, church, one author said the church is the only place that shoots its wounded. In other words, folks come to church battered and bruised. Folks come to church after a difficult week. Folks come to church depressed and stressed. And instead of lifting them up, many of us pull them down. We are shooting the wounded. This story is about the composition of God's church. Now, brothers and sisters, the message that John wanted to convey is this. In the church of the living Lord, you will not only find people who come to hear the word, you will not only find folks who come to meet Jesus, but you will find folks who come for a confrontation. Now I'm not talking about lighthouse, I'm executing this passage. Uh, John was saying that in the church, in the temple courts, you will not only find folks who want to meet Jesus. You will not only find folks who come to hear a word you will find folks who come for confrontation. You will find folks who come to exalt their self-righteousness. The Bible tells us, brothers and sisters, these religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, they dragged this woman practically naked and they threw her at Jesus' feet, demanding that she be stoned. Now they were religious, but they were not godly. I said they were religious, but they were not godly. You see, brothers and sisters, not because a person is religious means that the person is godly. You can be religious, but not godly. Uh, now, now, it seems as though you are looking at me as though you don't know what I'm talking about. Well, let me say it again. I'm saying, not because somebody knows the scriptures. Come on, man. All right. Means that they 
we are godly. Amen. Not because folks attend temple worship and dress in worshiping clothes. It means that they are godly. You can be religious but not godly. You see, to be religious has to do with one's belief and church affiliation. But to be godly has to do with the spirit of the living Lord. And so church of the living Lord, you can be religious, believe in God, attending church every Sabbath, but yet you are not filled with the Holy Ghost. Religious but not godly. A research was recently done here in the U.S. And it clearly shows that folks are religious. Many folks are religious but not godly. Listen to the research. The research shows that 94% of Americans believe in God. <coughs> in other words, 19 out of 20 believe in God. The research also shows that 83% of Americans call themselves Christians. Those who conclude that they are Christians, they conclude this, they came to this conclusion based on their birth. In other words, I was born into a Christian family. And so even though I have no time with the Lord, I am a Christian. Uh, those who said they were Christians, or they are Christians, they did this based on their birth. And also their religious affiliation. Some folks said that I'm an Adventist. I was baptized into the Adventist church, and so this makes me a Christian. This makes me godly. Ah, Church of the Living Lord, I stopped by here and they'll tell you to be godly has to do with the spirit of the living Lord. This is the point that Jesus wanted to convey to Peter. He said to Peter, Peter, when thou art converted, feed my sheep. In other words, Peter, you believe in me. Peter, you come into the sanctuary with me. But Peter, your heart is not yet fully with me. Uh, Peter, I've not yet possessed it in totality. You are preaching, yes, but with your lips, you will still deny me. But when thou art converted, you will never de deny me. Because it will no longer be lip service, but heart service. Being religious has to do with lip service. But being godly has to do with the power of the Holy Ghost. After Peter was converted, the Bible tells us he was filled with power. I ain't cost down nobody. All he did was bless the weary, comforted the lonely. One day he passed by a gate called Beautiful, and there he saw a crippled man all those years. He said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have, give I unto you. You can only give what you have. I have the Holy Ghost power. I have divinity to the Holy Ghost wrapped up in me. In the name of Jesus, take up your bed and walk. I'm saying, church, to be religious has to do with your church affiliation, but to be godly has to do with the power Amen. of the Holy Ghost. Oh, now, church of the living Lord, this story, let's get back to the story, because I know you're tired and you want to go home. This story has three S's. How many S's? Yes. How many S's? Yes. Let's talk about them, Elder Andrews, and then we'll go home. The first S is sin. What is the first S? Sin. The sin was adultery. I said the sin was adultery. To the Jews, adultery was a terrible sin. As a matter of fact, historians tell us that the rabbis thought it was better for a man to take his life than to commit adultery. Adultery Church of the Living Lord was technically a capital offense. You see, the Jews, what they did was categorize sin. They placed sin on a scale. This one is worse than that one. Yes. Wow. And even today, oh, yes. 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 even 
even in the church of the living Lord. We categorize it. No wonder some folks walk around believing they're so holy. Because they tell themselves, I don't commit the sins that you commit. No wonder some folks are always ready to stone folks and crucify them. Because they believe, once I don't do what you do, I am better than you. But I stop by here and they'll tell somebody that in the eyes of the living Lord, sin is sin. It doesn't matter what type of sin it is. Sin is sin. No, no, no. The Bible never categorizes sin. But the Bible speaks of types of sin. I want to tell you them. Is that all right? Uh, the first one can be found in Psalms 19.12. We call it secret sins. Now listen to the original Hebrew explanation of secret sins. Secret sins are sins we commit unknowingly or ignorantly. And then it went on in the Hebrew. Secret sins are the sins we conceal from the eyes of others. Lord, who can stand? <laughs> Uh, Lord, who can stand? Uh, some folks come to church in their nice dress and nice hat. But if you can only be a bird at the window, you will understand that nobody is worthy. Are you listening to me, church? It doesn't matter what suit you wear. It doesn't matter how you look. You can look pious and you can look holy. But thank God man sees the outside. But God sees the heart. is what we call secret sin. Yes. The second type that the Bible talks about is what we call besetting sins. Yes. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 1, Paul said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Amen. Now what Paul was really saying. But you've got to understand that Paul was writing from an athlete standpoint. Okay. You see in ancient times. Runners. They removed even the clothing that cling to them. <laughs> ah, let me tell you something. When you're tired even the lightest thing can be a weight. And so they removed even the things that cling to them. But Paul was saying. I press towards the mark for the price of the high calling. And as I press, I've got to be prepared to lay some stuff off. <laughs> and so besetting sins are those sins that cling so close to us. And they are easily committed. In other words, besetting sins are the sins that we are vulnerable to because of our weakness. And so the Bible says, you have secret sins. And then you have besetting sins. Some folks like to cry, oh, it's my weakness. I really mean that. It's my weakness. Well, let me tell you something. If you're in the church for 20, 30 years, it's time we get rid of some of those weaknesses. Because the power of God can set us free. And who the soul sets free is free indeed. We've got to grow. And we've got to move on to a higher level. When you're with Jesus, you don't stay stagnant. You graduate as you go on to paradise. And so it's time we get over some of those weaknesses. And so you have besetting sins. Now the third type of sin is what we call willful sin. Now willful sin is a sin we commit knowing when we do such. It is a sin. Now church, the next type of sin that we will wrap up with on this part it's what we call presumptuous sin, number four. It was David who said in Psalms 19.30, Lord, keep back thy servant. Keep him back from presumptuous sins. Now church, listen to the Hebrew definition of presumptuous sin. Presumptuous sin is choosing to take matters into your own hands rather than being guided by the precepts of God. Right. We 
when David came down after receiving the when, when Moses came down after receiving the Ten Commandments and, and saw them worshiping a calf, he took matters into his own hands and he took the commandments and he threw it and broke it. He took matters into his own hands. I stopped by here and here to tell somebody it's time we stop taking things in our own hands and place them in the hands of Jesus instead of worrying and fretting. Place it in the hands of Jesus when your back is against the wall. Put it in the hands of Jesus when you're stressed and depressed. Put it in the hands of Jesus when folks talk your name and drag you in the sand for the hands. Put it in the hands of Jesus because anything in the hands of Jesus is a force to reckon with. Put clay in his hands and he will make man. Put a rod in his hands and he will part the Red Sea. Put five loaves and two fishes in his hands and he will feed a multitude. Anything in the hands of Jesus is a force to reckon with. Put a sinner in his hands and he will become a saint. We've got to put things in the hands of Jesus. And so what are the sins? Secret sins. What's the second type of sin? Besetting sin. What is the third type? Willful sin. What is the fourth type? Now church, it doesn't matter what type of sin you commit. Sin is sin. And every unforgiven sin will lead to death. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is sin. And so I wish somebody will stop playing that we're so holy. Yes. Let's stop, let us stop pretending that we're so holy and sanctified. And when you come to church, you come among sinners. I say you come among sinners. You see, the church is a hospital for sinners. Have you ever seen a well patient in a hospital? When you recover or you think you recover, it's time to go home. But as long as you stay here, you are a sinner in need of Dr. Jesus. And one of these good days, the only time we will graduate from the hospital of sin is when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound. And the trumpet of God will cause the dead to rise first. This mortal shall put on immortality. It's graduation time. No more gossiping. Graduating time. No more arthritis. Graduating time. No more cancer. It's graduating time. But for now, we gotta stay in the hospital. I said, it doesn't matter what type of sin we commit. Sin is sin. And so the first S is what? Sin. Now the second S is what we call sin. Hold on. The first S is sin. The second S in the story is sin. Church of the living Lord, when the scribes and Pharisees Drag this woman <coughs> without mercy. Yes. What they were saying is that Lord, <coughs> she is the sinner. <coughs> when compared with us, yes. All right. <laughs> uh, she is a no good and she deserves to die. Are yeah. you following the church? Uh, Lord, she is the sinner. Now, now they forgot that the said the said. Uh, tend to touch that they were using the same old testament that they were quoting was the same testament that says we all were born in sin and shape in other words we all are sinners but they forgot that and they were now measuring themselves with this woman I tell you they dragged this woman mercilessly it's a terrible thing when a sinner is in the hand of fellow sinners. It's even worse when your fellow sinners believe that they are not sinners. Oh. It gets even dangerous when your fellow sinners place your sins in a higher category than their sins. Uh, that's when it becomes even more dangerous. Now, Church of the Living Lord, let's examine these men. Let's examine how hypocritical they were. They were pretending to have a passion 
to preserve the law of Moses. Be careful with folks who pretend to be what they are not. Amen. I said be careful with folks Amen. who pretend to be what they are not. Okay. They are pretending to have a passion to preserve the law of Moses. But in their hearts, their aim was to trap Jesus. Be careful with folks who pretend to be what they are not. A young woman, she came to me. I thought, I, 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 I'm here to tell you the story. She said, Pastor, Pastor, you love me, you love me. She said, he loves me, Pastor. I give my life to him. He loves me. Okay. I said, you sure you want to marry this man? <laughs> when I explain to her about marriage, and how it is sacred in the sight of the living Lord, I'm being not only good yoke with humble. She said, Pastor, I love him. Yeah. And he loves me too. Right. He does everything for me, Pastor. Yeah. He brings mangoes, he washes my clothes. He <laughs> Hallelujah. Good man. Good man. After they got married. She gave me pastor, pastor. How could you come and talk with me? Pastor, you know what? I found out that this man is married already. I said, what do you mean? Did you sign anything? I, I signed something that looked like a a, a did you sign anything? Uh, no, Church of the Living Lord. He he even went so far as to deceive this woman to believe she was signing an authentic document when he set up his friend to do it. I said, be careful with folks when they pretend to be what they are not. But I have discovered in this story that you can pretend to be all you want to be. There comes a time when the truth will find you out. And as long this woman. As a matter of fact, how did they catch her in the very act? You know what it means to get somebody in the act. Hold on, how did they catch her in the, what they're walking around people in windows? Hold on, how did they catch this woman in the very act? Now since they caught her in the act, they caught her in the act, where was the man? Hold on, I thought that the definition for adultery takes two people. But Church of the Living Lord, they caught this woman, they said, in the very act. Now, 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 the rabbinic law was specific on this point. The rabbinic law says that since adultery was practically a capital offense, the law demands an eyewitness. Are you following me? It was not enough to, see, to say I saw them go into the bedroom. It was not enough to say, I saw them leave in the bedroom. Oh, you have to see them in the act. Oh, now, how did they catch this woman in the act in the first place, but could not have gotten the man? Oh, now, theologians tell us that their true, true prearrangement, they let this man go. I tell you, some Christians can be hypocrites in sheep clothes. Ah, oh, church, they exercised their judgment in a pious way. I said they were pious. Leviticus 20.10 and Deuteronomy 22.22 22 says that both parties to adultery were to be put to death. But when you are possessed by the devil, you are pious. You're pious in your judgment. You're pious in your justice. I stop by here and they'll tell somebody, it's time we stop looking to man for justice. It's time we stop looking for man for fairness. And it's time we start to look to the Lord. The Bible tells us that they dragged this woman in the act of adultery. Their aim was to trap Jesus. Yes. 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 That's it. By presenting this woman to Jesus, yes. the leaders hope they hoped to impl impale the Lord on the horns of a dilemma. Mm. Listen to the dilemma. Right. If he says, 
if he says to stone her, yes. he would be he would be seen as rebellious yes. to the Roman law. Yes. Because the Jews under the Roman law, the Jews did not have the right to capital punishment. If he says you should not stone her, he would be seen as contradicting the Old Testament and being at, at, at odds with Moses. So whichever place, whichever way he turns, he is trapped. So they thought. I say so they thought. Uh, church, let me tell you something. As long as Jesus is on board, you can never trap him. Your back may be against the wall. You may feel as though you are cornered. But God always has another move. I say he always has another move. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, the devil thought that God was cornered. But God had another move. He said, I will veil my divinity with humanity and die in man's state. When Abraham, when his wife could not have given birth to a child, even though God said, I will make him a father of a great nation, the devil thought that he had God trapped because Abraham was now a hundred years old. But God had another move. God touched her womb and she conceived the boxing baby boy. I said, you read the children of Israel who are trapped by the Red Sea. And the devil thought that he had cornered God. But God made a way through the waters when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were trapped in a burning fiery furnace. The devil thought that he had God cornered. But God turned the flames into an air-conditioned unit. When Daniel was locked in a lion's den, the devil thought that he had God cornered. But God shut hungry lion's mouth. When this world was lost in sin, the devil thought that he had God cornered. But Jesus came as a pimp in a manger. And my Bible tells me, in the last days, when the devil believes that the world is cornered, he shall appear as king of kings and lord of lords. I tell you, church, you can never corner God. Amen. If somebody here today, you feel cornered. Your financial situation, you feel cornered. Your family situation, you feel cornered. I have good news for you. God has another move. Now, Church of the Living Lord, what was the first S? Sin. What was the second S? Sinners. Now we go to the third S. Sin. Sinner. Could I tell you? Could I? Could I tell you about a saint? You know what it is to. What you know what it means to walk in here a sinner and leave a saint? No, no, you did not hear me. You know what it means to walk in a congregation and everybody looking at you as though you are so scornful. But when you are now about to walk out. You can walk with your head lifted high. The only how that can happen is if you came in a sinner and you leave a saint. Well, let me tell you how it happened. They took the woman and they threw her at the feet of Jesus. Now, they interrupted the Lord's message. God was preaching a powerful message. And now they brought this woman and they threw her at Jesus' feet. I thank God that he will stop whatever he's doing to take care of sinners. It doesn't matter who you are or where far, how far you have gone. God has interest in you personally. Now, they took this woman and they threw her at Jesus' feet. Now, scholars tell us that within this woman's heart, she wanted a better life. But her life was messed up. She was a prostitute by profession. She was a prisoner of sin. Her life was dark. But she needed a better life. She wanted a way out. But she could not have found one. But church of the living Lord. 
the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth and the light. And I have news for you. As long as you are sincere in your desire, God will find a way to bring you to Jesus. He will make a way. Sometimes he will use your circumstances. Yes. Sometimes he will use your problems. Sometimes he will lose, use even your enemies. Yes. Yes. I say even your enemies yes. to bring you to Jesus. And so when your enemies planning your death, God is planning your life. When your enemies planning your destruction, God is planning your deliverance. When your enemy planning your failure, God is planning your success. When your enemy planning your bondage, God is planning to set you free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. Jesus took them and he took his finger. Now somebody say finger. He was teaching them a theological lesson. This was the set finger that wrote the law for Moses and gave him at Mount Sinai. And now this is a set finger that made man from the dust of the ground. Now this is a set finger that is writing in the sand. You come to tell me about Moses and you are talking to the very God in human flesh before Moses was. And so he stooped down and he started to write in the sand. Now the fourth S, the third S is what? Say it. Now he's writing in the sand. And the Bible tells us that they came and they looked. Now nobody knows what he wrote. I said nobody knows what he wrote. But whatever he wrote, don't play with the finger of God. Whatever he wrote, don't play with the hands of God. Whatever he wrote, don't play with the touch of God. Whatever he wrote, it revealed their personal life. And the Bible tells us that they turned away and they went their way. By now, the woman was there with her head down. She did not even know that they had left. Okay. Jesus then said, woman, and she's ashamed to look in the face of Jesus. The woman, uh, something tell her, you better look to Jesus. His voice is calm. His tone is gentle. I can feel his love in his words. I tell you, when you feel depressed, look at the face of Jesus. When you feel battered and bruised, look at the face of Jesus. When you feel like a no good, look at the face of Jesus. When you feel as though life is ended, look at the face of Jesus. And divinity has a way of flashing through humanity and energizing us. And so she lifts her head. Her head. And Jesus said, woman, where are thy accusers? Now this is theology. Where are thy accusers? I mean, where are the folks that wanted to kill you? I mean, where are your enemies? And she's looking around. And then, and then, then she said, I don't know, Lord. Where are thy accusers? I, I don't know, Lord. Now listen to this. God saved her Amen. from the hands yes. of death. Amen. But that's not the end of the story. God is not only a God who saves. He's a God who delivers. Yes. And so God, he saved her from death. He will now step into the spiritual realm. To set her free from the demonic force that bind her. Yeah. To set her free from guilt and sin and shame. And so he stepped into the, the, to the, to the spiritual level. And he said, woman, neither do I condemn you. Go. In other words, I save you from death. And now I deliver you from the powers that bound you. I stop by here and they don't tell you. A saint is a sinner who is saved by grace. And the same grace delivers from the power of the devil. Somebody say amen. He said get up and go. Walk with your head up. Let them talk if they're talking. You walk with your head up. 
Let them drag you in the sand if they drag him. Walk with your head up. Let them gossip if they want to. Walk with your head up. You are now free. And when the sun sets free, it's free indeed. Woman, go your way. God is not only a God who saves, He's a God who delivers. And so the first S is what? Sin. The second S is what? Sin. The third S is what? Sin. Sin. A sin is a sinner. Saved by grace. Saved from death, Sister Clemens. But when you say, you don't go back. And continue your dirty lifestyle. When God saves you, He delivers you. He delivers you from the demons of hell. He delivers you from your weakness. He delivers you from your sins. And you gotta go and sin no more. God is a God who saves and who delivers. My favorite writer says, we have heard a joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the mountains. Cross the waves. Onward this our Lord's command. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, show salvation, fall and free. Highest hills and deepest caves, this a song of Jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, God bless you and keep you.